There's no risk for Jesus, only sacrifice. Uh, He's called us to the Great Commission. So it's not wrong for you, even if it's careless, it's not sin for you to go to Sudan, you know, or or wherever and plant a church. Um, Especially if your pastor is calling you and saying, yeah, I, I affirm this. Um, it, it might, you know, so there's those elements where it's a, mm-hmm. it's a wisdom issue and yeah, the higher the risk, but maybe the higher the reward, but also the higher the chance that you end up dying um, or it going terribly. So it's probably not a, a sin issue as much as a wisdom issue. And then, you know, the example of Christ is that, yeah, I mean, it might be appointed that you, you go to die. I mean, Adoniram Judson goes and, you know, has very little fruit in his lifetime um, but his, his work in Burma, in M- Myanmar, you know, was the seedbed for what is now a Protestant movement in, in that country. But he saw very little. It was high risk, low reward in his lifetime. Looked like a fail. He died, suffered, terrible, you know, so many sufferings that he experienced. But out of his faithful labor, two centuries later, there's 10,000 Protestant churches across, you know, the area. And you think, oh, that, you know... So it might it looked it probably looked careless at the time, um, but if 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 you're steeped in prayer like the Lord Christ was in the garden, and your eldership is is sending you out, then there's probably enough there to be like, well, I got the Great Commission, I've got leaders who are above me saying yes, I've prayed and it seems right with me in the spirit. Well, let's go. Um, I'm not saying you should, but I think you've got to weigh those elements in. Because if we were counselling the apostles, right, after they got, you know, Peter, they get arrested. And what do they do? They go straight back to the very same place where they were told not to preach the gospel. And they do it again and they get arrested again. They get beaten. And you'd think, well, that was careless. But what, you know, but was it? (laughs) Uh, And so we, at least I think in the West, probably have far more risk aversion than risk kind of tolerance. And so we're probably way more likely to say no when we, we could say yes, even if it looks like a failure. Um, and in the message, I did say at the end, like there's no guarantee of short-term success. There's always guarantee of long-term success because God is sovereign and he uses everything for his glory and his purpose and will. Um, but yeah, it, it's a hard one. That's why you need counsel. That's why you need prayer. That's why you need people around you. And then sometimes there is just, I, I've got to do this. I've got to go. Um, and you know, who knows what the Lord will do with it. So I don't know. I, I don't think there's a perfect answer. It's a wisdom issue, uh, most likely. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, that would be hard. I, I think in the end, you do have to have be writing your conscience before the Lord, and um, whether or not that was wise or unwise or wrong for him to do that, um, he obviously felt led to stay and do um, finish the mission that the, that the Lord had given him. So yeah. There's, I don't think there's going to be a, an answer, would be my guess. Because um, they might have been, although they might have been in authority over him, it might have been a wrong use of their authority to say to come home. They might have been saying, this is too risky. I mean, this happens all the time. I've got <laughs> some of the friends in our church, they support a missionary somewhere in North Africa, and no mission agency would send them because they said it's too high risk. So it's like, well... If it's too high risk to take the gospel to somewhere that doesn't have the gospel, then, then they'll never get the gospel. So how, how will it ever happen? So, it's some, so they just sent themselves um, and they're trying, you know. And, you know, so there's probably times when you have to disobey authorities, um, although that's not your instinct, I think. You're probably going in with humility. But eventually when you're like, this is not right. I mean, the call to make disciples of all nations trumps the call of the mission agency, probably. But you don't want to start there. You know, that, that'd be a renegade kind of spirit that you wouldn't want. There's some thoughts, yeah. And, but I'm very inexperienced in this. I wouldn't you know, be interested to know more from what other people's perspectives are. What are any other reflections on your own experience of uh, wanting to step out but feeling that? pull back, like I don't really want to take the risk. Any Anyone else experiencing that? Yep, Sigur. Yeah. And uh, I think the good indicator of whether or not you'll take risks in the future is do you take risks today? Um, you, you, you know, you won't start taking risks in, in Sudan if you're not taking them here in Addis, you know, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that, you know, save a miracle, but 
Um, so it's good to keep practicing. You start it, you start it now and, and you keep going forward and go forward and grow in it and get someone to disciple you, someone who, you know, does a lot of risk taking perhaps and you, go, you, you get alongside them and you get their faith to help you to step out and take more faith if it's a struggle for you like it is for me. Um, yeah, so I encourage you, go back and if you missed it, go back and listen to the message. I think it's, it's an encouraging one. Um, you can read John Piper's book, Risk is Right. It's very simple. Um, and I think it's something you've got to keep pressing into because, yeah, it, it's the instinct is security and safety. Um, and it, it might even be the counsel of those around you is, oh, just play it safe. You've got a family. Play it safe. Um, but instead, you know, that's not how the gospel goes forward across the world. It's, it's through the blood of the martyrs and through suffering that the gospel seems to grow. Suffering's the seedbed for it, which I don't speak from a huge amount of experience. Let's be real. Um, so I'm not pretending to be an authority on the matter. All right, well, let's, let's bring it back in. We, yesterday, for those who missed some of it, we spent a, three sections of our time looking at this prospectus. How do we plant a church? How do we think about planting a church? Uh, we looked at location, where are we going to go? People, who are we trying to reach? And team, who's going to do it with us? What we're going to do today is we're going to try and go through the rest of the prospectus, uh, and then we'll see where we get to for the afternoon session. Okay, so for the guys that missed yesterday, we've, we've so far covered location. Where are you going to want to plant? Then we covered people, who, who, who we're sort of aiming at. And then we covered church plant team. So how are we going to build a team? What's that going to look like? And all that type of stuff. Today we're going to start this session with the whole premise of leadership. So there's really five questions under this section. Number one, who would make up your initial advisory team? How do you see an advisory team functioning to support this church? So what's that? That's looking at, you know, the aspect of, hey, I don't want to just be like out by myself. <coughs> Who, who's going to be helping me? Who's, and that's not just church planting team. It's people from outside. It's who, who's going to be able to help me and help mold me? Number two, how do you see plurality of eldership developing in your church? Number three, how will you and your family receive care in this church plant? Number four, how do you determine when the church planting team will be merged with new attendees into a functioning church? And then number five, how will you approach church membership in the church that is started through this plant? So, Riley, why don't I ask you how we did it in Parramatta, and then I'll come in. Who would make up the initial advisory team? How do you see an advisory team functioning to support Sovereign Grace Church Parramatta? Great, yeah, so an advisory team, as Dave said, is a group of men, most likely, maybe some women, who help you figure out um, how we're going to do this, what's the journey going to be like, where are we going to go, all these prospectus questions and things like that. So the way it looked for me was uh, Dave and Brendan and Patrick, who were the elders at the time, were certainly a part of the process, particularly Dave. Um, he was my mentor through the process. I also had a coach from Sovereign Grace USA, one of my friends, a guy called Eric Tibetsky, who's... He hasn't come out to you guys, has he? Oh, man. Turbo's the best. He's awesome. Uh, and uh, so he was my coach, and he was really helpful because the, the coach's role is not so much to say, this is what you should do. The coach's role is to really ask you the questions and make you answer them for yourself, but guide you to figure out how you want to answer the questions. So some of the things, you know, he used to do with me was, you know, not, he would never tell me what to do or even give an example of what he'd done. But he'd be saying, well, how are you going to make decisions about this? What type of information do you need? And how are you going to figure this out? And I want you to report back the next time we meet with your decisions on even one of the topics for me was how, what's your process for making decisions? Because as a church planter, you're making decisions all the time. Will we teach this, do that? Will we go here or not? Will we run this or not? Will we spend money on this? And I, I actually find decision making difficult you know, I, especially the micro decisions. And so one of the things that we spent a lot of time on was figuring out how do, what categories do you have to even make decisions? So that was really helpful. And then, and then I had my um, core team of guys that we spoke about yesterday, and they then sort of made up the on-the-ground advisory team. So I'd be pitching my ideas to them, getting their feedback. I'd be, and I still do this now, I often asking them, hey, is there any sinful patterns you're seeing in my life? Is there any leadership struggles that you are identifying, how's my preaching, how's my leading, um, those type of things, they're, they're a part of my advisory team so that when I'm 
just going at it on my own, I've actually got eyes on because I need that. I need help. And they often, they often have great comments. Like one guy in particular, he can always pick it. I'll, I'll come to him and I'll say, is there anything you've noticed in my leadership? Like, how am I going? And he'll just ask, how have your quiet times been the past two weeks? And, it, and I'll be like, actually, they've, they've not been very good. And he's like, yeah, I've, no, I've just seen it in your leadership. And you think, that's really helpful, stuff like that. So having a team of people that are for you, but also can help you think strategically about what you're doing has been really helpful. Um, and so I established that really early on. Uh, and it's been a great benefit um, in the whole process. That's great. Yeah, so if we were, from a Sovereign Grace perspective, if you were going to, out to plant a church, we'd be recommending to you to have two or three other, other men outside of the church, probably, that are walking alongside you, that you can run decisions past. So if you've got Michael, you've got Josh, maybe another one as well. It's like, all right, you know, we, this is how the church is going. What do you think? What do you think I could be preaching? What's your perspective? And then you have to have people within. And which, which draws us on to the next question. How do you see plurality of eldership developing in your church? Because it's partly how we use the core team. And yeah. So one of my convictions is I believe churches should be elder-led and led by a plurality of elders. Um, I think that the, this pattern throughout the New Testament is that there's elders, not elder. Uh, and so early on, I wanted to, as, mu- as quickly as I could, develop new pastors. Uh, and so I've it's, but that takes a long time, right? So it's been a slow process. So I've been always, I'm always looking for future potential elders. Um, and early on, they developed one guy, a guy called Richard, um, who I, I particularly thought, even though he had no, he'd never in his life planned to be a pastor, <laughs> no desire for it. I started saying, I think the Lord might be calling you. I, I see a grace in your life. So then we started meeting more regularly once a month. And then I offered him a pastoral internship for one day a week. Uh, And then this year I offered him uh, a full-time pastoral internship so that he could study at our academy, sort of like what you guys are doing, just one day a week. And just bit by bit giving him opportunity, uh, giving him preaching opportunities, study opportunities, leading group opportunities, um, leadership opportunities, very much like what you guys are doing, in the hope that over time the... This, we can test and evaluate his calling. Um, one of the challenges over that time has been his own internal sense of like, am I called or not? Uh, and, you know, that it's just been something we've had to work through. So it's a, been a slow process. So we're coming on three years. We're still a single elder church. Uh, I don't want to rush in, like the scriptures say, and lay hands on too quickly. It's a lot easier, in a sense, to ordain someone than to unordain them. Uh, so once they're in, and the Sovereign Grace has a long process, which you guys will find out more about, but once you're in, you're sort of, to get out of ordaining someone, you have to lay charges against them. They have to have sinned. You know, it has to be a significant matter. So I, I'm taking my time on it. Uh, it's a priority. We put a lot of money in, into it. it. It takes effort, resource. Uh, and then I'm also thinking, not just Richard, I'm thinking, who else? So I've got another guy, Joel, who joined the church in like week two, and had been to Bible college, had a desire for pastoral ministry. But my initial, you know, instinct with him was like, I'm not quite sure him and his marriage and I'm just going to wait it out. So we've been waiting it out and then he decided he wanted to do the academy this year. So we brought him on and even then I wasn't 100% sure. But as I've seen him develop over this year, I've been like, I got a lot more faith for this. So next year, I think I'll offer him an internship for a day so I can get more time with him, build trust, build trust with his wife, get to know her, see how their dynamic is. Uh, and they're, they're a beautiful, beautiful couple. So I don't know, you get the kind of point, is it slow, lots of building trust, lots of testing, lots of opportunities. For him, the thing is, I've never seen him lead a team. So you, you think of a pastor, they're called to feed the sheep. He can do that. He can preach, you know, care for the sheep. He can counsel, uh, but equip the sheep um, and lead them. Uh, and that's a necessary skill of pastoral ministry, not just being a doer, but being a, a raiser up of other leaders and actually executing ministries and, and seeing it happen. So I, next year, that's what I'll do with him is give him more authority and see how he goes with it. Good. Yeah, there's no doubt, like the, um, the risk stuff, I'll, I'll take your question, so the risk stuff that Riley's talking about, we often think of that as, um, you know, trying to reach lots of people that are going to be antagonistic towards us, and that's true. 
There's a real risk in actually this piece of pursuing, pursuing friendship with somebody, bringing him into a core team with a view to potentially even ordain. There's a risk factor in that. In some ways, Michael's taking a risk on all of you, pulling all of you into his leaders meeting on Tuesday. That's a risk because like, you, could, you could be like not even believing what he's believing, and, but you have to. You have to start to take a move forward. Otherwise, you won't, get, you won't get anywhere. The curious thing is the Apostle Paul talks about the importance of plurality, that you need more than one elder. But at the same time, he says, but don't be hasty on the laying on of hands. So he's like, you need to aim for this, but don't rush it. Because if you get the wrong guy, it's really difficult to change it. Um, but plurality is definitely important. We did what Riley did. We started a core team. I had three men on that. Um, and I just started to give them my life, really. And I started to treat them like elders, even though they weren't elders. So they were like elders towards me. So any big decision, I wanted to know, hey, what do you think? But they weren't operating as elders to the church. They're more operating like that to me. And I was able to develop them. And one of them in particular became a pastor. Well, two of them became pastors, actually. Um, so that's what we did. Yeah, tell me. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, look, what I've seen is maybe a bit different to what you're describing. I think the ideal is you, you would probably arrive somewhere with a plurality of elders, meaning two. But say, say like, you, you go from two to three, three to four. You don't, you don't want the third guy or the fourth guy feeling like they're down the rung. That's the elders' responsibility to help them understand. Now, now so, so if Riley became a pastor in my church, we are, before God, totally equal. And I'd want him to feel that, know that, see that. That's, well, that's on me. So if he's still feeling like, oh, I'm quite inferior, we're going to have to have a talk about that because biblically you are both elders. So that's all to do with how you train them. When I arrived in Australia, there was just me. So you had to work hard <laughs> to train others. And then I don't think Brent, Brendan wouldn't feel, who's my associate pastor, he wouldn't feel like our days are much better older than me and whatever he says. <laughs> he's very happy to push back on me, encourage me, correct me because it's a team. But that's about my, how I developed that. Um, so you are right. If, if in your culture you just go as an elder and then you try and train people, if you keep them down here and they're just relating to you, you're doing it wrong. You've got to help them understand. You need to stand alongside me. So if you're going to be an elder, we, we have equality now. <clears throat> Before God, we might have different roles, but we're equal. Yeah, experience is a factor where it's like oh, it's, the, the other elders might be quite... Yeah, not subservient, but quite happy to go with what the leader guy thinks, sometimes just because he's more experienced than they are. But I wouldn't want them to feel um, we're down a rung. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Well, yeah, so the qualifications for eldership in the Bible, they, well, they're, the quali- they're the standard that you have to be, but it doesn't say anybody hit that standard, boom, you have to be an elder in that church, and they have to take you. So I'm qualified to be an elder, but I can go to South Korea and rock up and say, I'm going to be a Presbyterian pastor. I'm qualified to be an elder. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not South Korean. <laughs> I might not fit in their culture. And they might say, but actually, we're, we're pedo baptists We believe in baptizing infants, and you don't. So you can, okay, so we all understand that we don't all fit everywhere. Just because you have the qualifications doesn't mean you fit the gap that's needed. Ordination is actually just testing whether somebody's actually qualified. That's all ordination is. So you don't have to go to pastor's college, for example, to be ordained in sovereign grace. An ordination process is actually just let us test you. So you're saying you have the qualifications. You're saying you're able to teach. What we're really doing is testing your convictions. So in sovereign grace, we would say, look, for somebody to be truly qualified to be an elder, there's going to need to be conviction. There's going to need to be character, which is what all the qualifications are about. There's going to need to be competency. Like, can they actually do it? Because you meet lots of people that actually hit all the character qualifications. They're just not very good leaders. They're just not very good at it. And so you're like, okay, that's going to be a challenge. Um, so you've got all those things. And then you have actually got compatibility. So would we, do we fit everywhere? And sometimes we, we don't. So I'm qualified to be an elder, but I might go to a, like, <laughs> some, of the, some of the churches that Amy was talking about yesterday, the sort of hill, Hillsong. If I went to Hillsong, I'd be like, I'm qualified. I don't fit at all. It's just they're not my people. Um, so you have, to, you have to work that out. So ordination, I think, doesn't so much slow it down, so it just really works out for any given man. Are they truly qualified in the sense of conviction and character in our context? It tests that, which I think is a good thing. Otherwise, you would just have to go with, well, 
He says he's qualified. They seem like a good guy. Let's do it. You could test it more quickly than we do. Like, it could be a shorter process, but because of the way our polity is structured, once you're ordained, you then have the ability to influence and shape the entire denomination. Um, and so we're slow to give away that authority um, because of the implications of what that is. Well, and that's biblical, because if, if the Apostle Paul says, don't be hasty on the laying on of hands, yeah, it doesn't make that sense if we say, oh, we're too slow. He's saying, be slow. He's deliberately saying it. It doesn't, I don't know how long you think it takes. You can get ordained in six months. Now, your pastor would have to put you forward as that candidate, but if he puts you forward as that candidate, you'll be ordained in six months. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other element I would add is um, I've had three guys start internships and not complete them. Um, and so if we were hasty, you know, you, you could end up with a real um, issue there as well. Because as soon as you give authority, you've given authority. And now they have influence. Now they have the people. Now, you know. Um, and so, yeah, time, they can be too long or they can be too short. And you just got to, in wisdom, figure out. Any other questions on, plura uh, on, yeah. The guys we choose for, like, my core team would meet the characteristics to some degree of an elder. So they operate in an elder-like fashion without the authority. And the final say ends on me and the responsibility ends on me. So you kind of... We try to have our cake and eat a little bit too. Yeah. We've definitely, in Sydney, in my church, we've benefited from not being too rushed. So I would be quite happy to go from somebody not knowing them that well to be ordaining them within, say, two to three years. Say if you didn't even know. I, I, I get that. But we wouldn't do it quicker than that, and it's helped us. So we had a guy turn up two years ago, three years ago, from Dubai. Yeah. Three years ago, from Dubai. Already been a pastor in Dubai for like 15 years or something. Great guy. Said he loved sovereign grace, said he loved our values, loved our shape of virtues, all in. Great. This guy's been a pastor for years. He loves our values. He actually is leaving the church in Dubai because he loves our values so much and wants to do that. Australian man. Yeah, we could have just transferred his ordination. Could have transferred his ordination, um, but we didn't. And the whole premise was, hey, listen, why don't you come here, do a residency, let us get to know you, you get to know us, let's work out if this is a good fit. We get to the end of sort of like a year, year and a half in, he feels like it's a great fit. We don't feel like it's a good fit at all. And you think, why? Because all the values we're saying are exactly the same. And he would say, I agree with all this. But the virtues were not what was displayed. So, so fellowship, for example. He would say, I love friendships. Okay. Here's the thing, though. At the pastoral team care groups, your wife never comes. It's just you. Well, she's very busy. Uh-huh, I get that. But it's actually a value for us. And so we don't really feel like we know you very well, like at all. And they started to be offended by that because humility was also lacking. And you're like, yeah, it's thank goodness we took our time. They ended up uh, leaving. They weren't very impressed. But if we had ordained him, which we could have done on paper, he would have been in our leadership team. And now we start to see he doesn't even agree with us on some of this fellowship stuff. What are we going to do now? And then it came out as he was starting to leave that really he felt called by God to come to us to change us. And you're like, ah, oh, that wasn't said on day one either. So there is real merit in just walking slow, not too slowly, but slowly enough because you put the wrong man in with you. It's going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, you're not, you're not in sin if it's a single elder church. It's best practice, but it's... Just to, just to be clear, if it is a single elder church, what we do in Sovereign Grace, so he went out as a single elder, that's where the advisory team comes in. And the advisory team, on the whole, uh, is actually meant to be ordained elders. So say AB goes out, and he actually just goes out by himself. You might say, okay, well, if Michael's ordained, and Josh is ordained, um, and I know Dave Taylor a bit, maybe they could just be on my advisory team just so I could speak with them once every couple of months about things I'm planning in the church, doing in the church. You're kind of using them as fellow elders. They're not elders in your church, but they have that caliber. That could be really, really helpful. And then eventually that team dissolves because Mikey's coming on, so he's going to be an elder. So you're like, okay, well, we, you don't need us anymore, bro. That tends to be the way it works. Keeps the church safe and keeps you safe. Did you have a question on so we, we don't like in Sovereign Grace just bringing other pastors in and the church have to go with it. We don't, we don't like doing that. Far more, hey, so say even if it was me, 
I would not come to Addis on the premise of, hey, I'm already an elder, so I'm going to be an elder here. Even if Michael needed one, it would be more, okay, I'm, I'm just going to be like a resident helping. I'm not an elder in your context. Um, let's see if I can win your hearts and love on you and you can get to know me and you can decide whether you want me to be a pastor. And so then it would be Michael saying, yeah, we want David to be a pastor. And the church saying, yes, and then you go for it. So that that's definitely takes a bit of time, a bit of a process. Because if people are going to, you know, the Bible calls us to submit to our pastors, submit to our elders. We don't just want to put candidate A in front of everybody and say, well, here's your guy. Which is often in Pentecostal churches, right? You're just like, I was a new guy. And you're like, oh, I don't even know. It's actually, sovereign grace isn't, isn't congregational. But it is the one thing that very often, most of the time, the church is very involved in the ordination piece. So, we, so when we um, ordained, I don't, you, we were sending you out. But even for you, we were sending you out. We, we wanted to ordain Riley, so you put him up as a candidate to the church. As in, you know what, you've known Riley now for a couple of years. You've seen him preaching. And we want to ordain him. We believe he's got those qualifications. As part of that process, we'd like every member in the church to write to us as to whether you would love him to be ordained or if you'd have questions and concerns, biblically, about, you know, I, I'm concerned for that. And that's what we do. And it's one of those only times where the church gets very involved. And, and it's always a precious moment when the church is right to you saying, we love him, please make him an elder in our church. We want to follow him. and That's great. Um, that helps us. Okay. Next question. How will you and your family receive care in this church plant, Mr. Spring? Well, it's been one of the great, the great things about what you've established for us in, in Southern Grace Australia is that um, we, we have done this entire church plant with <laughs> just the most amount of care you could imagine. Um, so when, uh, when we were part of the leadership team, there was already a care group for my wife um, and I, we would be with your wife and, and the other pastors. And so we're meeting every six weeks, sharing our, our sin, our struggles, our marital problems. Um, and then uh, there was once every six weeks, we met just as guys, so pastors. Um, and we were sharing our personal guy struggles and sins, spurring each other on. Uh, and so th there was that element. Um, and that has actually still continued to this day. Um, I obviously need a lot of care. <laughs> and the friendship piece. We just don't want to do it on our own. Not only that, then Dave is the regional leader and as a friend, he's just connected with Maddie and I and constantly caring for us. Uh, and then there's been the element that Dave's met with our core team and continued to care for us as a team and as a church uh, and has continued the fellowship with our church. Um, and so... The, the lines of communication are open, the opportunities are open, so that if there's any problem, we can just come in and ask a question. So it's been, it's been great, and I would highly encourage you, if, if you pastor or you plant, to establish those patterns of care, um, lock them in, in dates, make it happen, um, because otherwise, just bit by bit, your marriage can freeze out, your parenting can go downhill, um, your soul can go weary and tired, and... And unless you're having those regular moments where you can be honest, it can just build up to be something that's so big that now it's too hard to share that our marriage is in absolute tethers and et cetera. So. That's good. Yeah, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but you've got to work out how am I going to be cared for as a pastor. We'll look at it a little bit tomorrow morning because as soon as you have two churches here in Addis, you've already started a region, what Sovereign Grace would call a region. So we'll look at a bit, okay, what does that mean? How do these churches work together? One of the pieces is they start to care for each other at a pastoral level. They're not, they're not just by themselves. Um, Mikey? It's entirely up to what, what say, you, Michael and Josh would want you to do here. Yeah, there's, no rule. there's no rule. But um, my recommendation would be, if you're close enough, you'd probably stay in that type of care group for yourself. Uh, but you'd want to be creating it elsewhere over time. But, but when we actually did our pastoral care group, which we do... We, Riley and Maddie are only going to leave it this year, at the end of the year, and that's after three, two and a half years. So, it, you know, th there's no need to, like, leave it. So was, we're able to just still have them as part of us and care for them, and it's probably the ideal. Um, but that's if you're close. <laughs> so if you go and move three hours away, it's like, yeah, it's going to be really hard to still be a part of that. So you have to think a bit outside the box then of how I'm going to create this for myself and my wife if I'm married. And I think what you find with and Grace is that there's actually not many rules about pretty much anything on the ground level of how the church other than the doctrine what you have to preach and the values 
it's it's up to it'll be up to what Michael and, and the guys want to do here as to how it'll all look. Um, so we the rule is we want to make sure you're cared for. How you do it? Up to you. Yeah, but we wanted like how are you going to be cared for? If we're going to get behind your plant, who's looking after you? Who's in your life? And because you're going to need that. Yeah, yeah. So that was me. So I moved to the other side of the world. Um, how, do, how was I cared for? For many, for a long time, I still would get monthly calls and um, back to my pastor in the UK. And we'd still just talk about, and he'd be talking, how are you going and how are you and what's happening? And so it, it ends up being, it has to be more on, online, but it, it is important what Riley said, to set it in so you know what's happening rather than just, oh, let's stay in touch. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> and you're like, oh. So we just set it in. It's almost like a care group, but sadly you're online or on the end of a phone. Also, he would commit to seeing, trying to come out once or twice a year. So that was super helpful too. So I knew that we were going to get a few visits um, of people. That was really, really good too. And then the other elements, not just for you, is establishing care for your teams. So now I've recreated those care structures within my team <laughs> so that the future pastors are in a care group, etc. Yeah. Okay. How will you determine when the church planting team will be merged with new attendees into a functioning church? So for my context, we, we left with 28 members who were part of your church. And so that was a church we just started. Um, so Septem September 15, yeah, we started as a church. And um, yeah, we, we don't do a covenant or anything like that, but we just identified ourselves as a church. But week one, I also said to the guys, we're no longer the church plant team. We're just a church now. And so... Any new person that comes in, we're all equal, equal status, equal, we're, it's almost like everything we just did for nine months, it's over. <laughs> you know, we love each other, but we're, we're looking now to have everyone, any new member who joins, they're a full member of our church. So we um, started the church and then we did what was called starting point. We did it over 10 weeks with new members, like what you guys are doing, membership class, but we did it longer so that we could teach them more on our doctrines and values. And then we took in 10 members or something like that. And so then our church went from 28 to 38 and then, or whatever it was, and they were just part of the church straight away. Um, and that was, that was how we did it. Yeah, when we, when we moved out to Australia, we went in June and we planted in September. Over that three months, I took everybody through our passions and values. And then so the week before we started, I officially took them into membership of our new church plant. And then we, as soon as we started the plant, we just did the starting point course, which is the new members class for 10 weeks. So we took people into membership. Oh, I reckon our first lot, probably like on a week 13 or 14, and probably about 30 people then. And then another three months later, another 20, and we grew from that. I know you'd have to think through what it's like in your context, because I know you went a full year before taking anybody into membership, whereas we, were, we had membership week one. We were, we were much quicker, which isn't right or wrong, but it's just thinking through. Yeah. Well, particularly if you've got, say you're taking 20 people from this church, yeah, you're like, so you've, so you've taken them to this church, already members, you've just spent three, three, six months developing them into a team. Are they now not members of this new church? So it's like, oh no, they're just members, they're members now, they're just transferring their membership to this new church plan. What about like, automatically? No. So, new, so no, so that would be what we did. Is, is the church planting team would be, or his, he did, the church planting team was the people from Trinity, effect, effectively. And then on week one, you announced that, hey, in four weeks' time, we're going to start a new members class, just like you do. But we didn't make people wait a year for that. We were just like a, probably a month in, that if, you, if you're around and you're interested in joining, we start our classes. And Yeah, they don't, you can't have, oh, you can, but you wouldn't have somebody come in and then, oh, they're members because they've arrived. No, they do the class. No, and they have to agree to membership. So we do have, I, did, I say we don't have a covenant, but we do actually have six things they agree to, to participate on Sunday mornings, participate in group, serve, give, um, submit to the leadership of the church and be on mission. We taught them through it. What we do is we don't actually make them agree um, to them per se, but what we explain is this is who we are. And so when it comes to understanding the type of church you're joining, we'd want you to understand this is exactly who we are. We do ask them then in the, in the interview on time with them, is there any of them that you find really hard or struggle with? 
And I think there's, on our membership form, there is a tick box to say, do you agree with the seven shared values, just so we can get a feel. Because if somebody says, oh, no, it's great. You can just talk about, oh, what's, why is that? And, and so that we can it's disciple them. It's not mandatory. In, my, in fact, to be honest, most people that join my church, um, they would say, I don't think I agree with the complementary leadership. Most people would say it. Because they've never heard of it. They've never heard of it. And they've never been in a church that's done that. And it's, it's easy for me, perhaps, because I'm able to say, hey, listen, I was nervous about that too. And uh, would you journey with me in that? And why don't we talk about it some more? And, and we actually did a preaching series. So I often say, would you listen to that and, and see what you think? And, and often, often they're not like anti it. It's just like, I don't, I've never heard of a church doing that. It doesn't fit, fit right. But I do like the church. And so we don't, we don't make them not join then. We're fine for them to join. That's most of the time, I think, for that one. Uh, I think everybody would probably agree with what we've said in principle. I just think some people execute it better than others. Yeah, it could also be, though, say even if you went the route that we're doing, if you don't teach the... One of the things that can happen, which is really difficult, is say your church planting team has just spent the last six months together. They're actually really close. <laughs> and even though they know they're going to ch- plant a church for other people, they actually start getting a bit disappointed when other people start coming because they're like, we had something so nice. And so you definitely have to, it's a strange phenomenon, but you definitely have to start to train and help the guys understand. I remember saying to our team, and I actually got them to do it, we did it visually. I'm like, look, I want us to stand together and huddle in. Now I want us to turn around. And so let's all look out. And I'm like, that's what this plant is going to be about. It's not about us. We're planting for other people. But, it, but you realize, oh, we're, we're going to have to educate because people come in because they want to plant a church, but then you build them closely together and then they don't like it when people start adding in because you do get tired that could be a, a quirk of it <laughs>